Columbus. I texted so. with him myself. I talked to him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a new phone on my number, and I think he blocked me because I <laughs> called him several times. And that was oh, straight to us. Oh, we need to correct that on our Sunday school list. Well, no, uh, okay. Gene's the other too. number's still the same, but when I'm on the road, I take that phone. And, uh, so I think I think. Well, I'll send a message to Davis. Davis, if you're watching, don't block Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I did on purpose. And, uh, how's Bob doing, man? Uh, mm, mm. Uh, well, we'll go to back to the pulmonologist Wednesday, and he's been fighting me all the time. I keep saying you need to go to the hospital, and he won't let me. So I'll have to go. It's probably just because they're tired of going to the doctor. Hmm? It's probably just tired of going. Yeah, but this is a result of they're probably going to put him on oxygen. I would think or something because he's just not bleeding. He just can't breathe. And I did find, thank goodness. He had bought my mother a transplant chair uh, when, she, when I was having to take her to doctors and stuff, and I found it, cleaned it up, and it's in my car. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to see Leon Green's brother uh, up in Charlotte the other day, so he, he knew us. He was good. He thought for a while. And, and, uh, yeah. So it looked like he's doing pretty good. He's gained a little weight. Gained a little weight. Good. So we'll pray for him. And, Amen. Oops, I'm going into your time here. So. <laughs> I've turned it on so that people can hear us. I, I know Davis is watching. Any other good prayer? Tell me how many people. <laughs> well, right now, just, well, there's a couple. Well, this one, this one, you go first. I don't know. Davis is watching. Hey, Davis. Uh, I'll let you pray for everybody at the end. Okay. Yeah. And then, but, uh, see you know, um, I have a, a daughter. Um, who's an alcoholic. Um, she was, when she was in high school, had the best testimony of any, of any teenager you've ever heard. But then went to college and, you know, got into all that college stuff. She has two children, um, not married. She really needs God. And I pray, and I pray, and I pray. But if y'all would just help me pray for her, her name is Brady. She just, she really needs a lot of prayer right now. I kind of wall it off, but that's because she was on the phone and that couldn't be done. But uh, if y'all would just keep her in your prayers and help me pray for her. <coughs> and uh, I don't know if Bob told y'all or not, but um, Jeff is coaching at a Bible school in Lancaster. So I, I'll be doing a little bit of work from home for him, but I have a dad that can pray with her. Ooh. Oh. Some other type of work to compensate. Well, yeah. Kids need So you want to do the prayer at the end? Uh, well, you can, you can do it if you like. Okay. <coughs> I don't want to be over there. Oh, <laughs> well, let's let's wait and we'll do the closing prayer with our request when we, so we can get started. Uh, last week, I would started talking about the seven mysteries of Scripture, of the New Testament, really. And um, I don't even know if I said this, but I, I should have said it. Most of what we call the seven mysteries were thought of by the Catholic Church. So uh, I agree with probably all of them, but what people don't realize is that there were like 40 mysteries at one point, and that caused some people in the second, third century to call Christianity a mystery religion. Uh, but I got to think about this this week because I thought, well, we've talked about mysteries, but I really didn't give you all a... a uh, explanation of why we have the mysteries. 
you know, we just say, well, these are the, the mystery teachings of Paul. Uh, Peter and John were in there a little bit too, but most of this comes from one person, that's Paul. Uh, and there's a mystery in that. It's like, where did Paul get this information? Uh, because he talks about it in his letters. And there are some people suggest that, well, the disciples told him, which seems a little unlikely because the disciples didn't talk to him or trust him for a while. Uh, and then so it's like, well, maybe Barnabas told him because Barnabas was with the disciples. But, and this is just me, but I, I sort of think that Paul got this through revelation because he hints at that in one of them. Uh, and I, I go back to Paul where it says in Acts that he went to Saudi Arabia for three years after he was, uh, had his Damascus Road experience and his blindness was healed. He didn't go back to Jerusalem. He went to Saudi Arabia. Uh, where in Saudi Arabia, we don't know. But I thought about this too. What we know now about where Mount Zion is, which is in Saudi Arabia, and the cave of Elijah is on that mountain. And so it appears that Elijah went to this place, which is called the mountain of God. And it was called the mountain of God then too. So it's pretty obvious that maybe that's Sinai. Uh, and I thought, well, I wonder if he went to that same place, which would have been close. And it's where it seems like a lot of mystics and prophets go to sort of get their head together. So maybe he went there. At any rate, he stayed for three years. And uh, while he was there, he was pretty much deep in prayer and, and talking to God because, and you think about it, here's a guy who was leaving his heritage. Uh, he is stepping away from Judaism into a new religion of Christianity. In essence, for them, this was stepping away from God to a new God. But then he comes to realize it's the same God. But to the Jew... Jesus was claiming to be a second Godhead, and that just wasn't possible for them. So for a Jew to become a Christian, it was like leaving God and, and adopting a new God. Uh, we know now that it wasn't. And it's part of this that I think Paul considered mysteries because here's a guy who had been trained and raised as a Jewish scholar who is now going against everything his scholarship taught him only to find out that he's really not going against it. He's just adding some things to it that people don't know. And I think that's the mysteries we're talking about. Uh, because if you look at them, they all seem to be a new teaching that applies only to Christianity. Uh, and they're new teachings on old thoughts. Uh, we talked about the first one, the first <coughs> mystery. And, and actually, Peter gave it to us, but Paul uh, echoes it about angels serving the church. The purpose of the angels was always to be the messengers of God. Now they serve the church, and we see it in how they minister to Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit comes, and the angels, what little bit we hear about angels, are angels passing on a message, uh, such as at the ascension. Uh, the angels were there, and they said, why do you see this man go? He'll come back as he's leaving. And then uh, they go to Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit comes. And another reason we don't see the angels a lot after that is it's like I told someone, they said, well, I believe in angels. I said, I do too. I said, but why are you concerned about angels if you have the Holy Spirit to communicate with? You know, people don't realize that through the Holy Spirit, we have direct access to God. Uh, and if we can learn to be still and quiet and accept that, we can find that God speaks to us uh, through his spirit. Now, it's not always like an audible voice. And people say, well, did you hear God? But I've heard preachers say, well, I was talking to God this morning. Well, we may not have been talking in a conversation, but it is a spiritual thing because uh, I used to drive an hour to work and back over in Chesterfield. That was my prayer time. And when you're in prayer, I don't know, to me it was like having a conversation. At some points I felt like Jesus was sitting right beside me in the car. And it's like I would just verbalize something. And I didn't follow a formal prayer. It was more like I was talking to, to Jesus. And then it's like something popped in my head and it was like an answer. And I've always told people, I said, sometimes I get an answer that seems too smart for me to have. So I think that's coming from God. Um, 
But I think Paul does the same thing. I think he's realized that the God that they worship in the temple who was behind the veil and aloof and only people, one person went in there a year, this God has made himself available through this incarnation. That's the first mystery. Now to a Jew, that's a pretty big deal because they went to the temple not to see God, but to see where God was and to make sacrifice, but they never saw him. And now Christians are saying, you have God within you. The idea of the incarnation, which is the second one, and I've got some scripture from Timothy, from John, and from Paul on that. But the key thing about the incarnation is Christ is in you. That's the Holy Spirit we're talking about. And that's another pretty strange thing for people to think, wait a minute, if even if Jesus is God, this is a Jew thinking, then how can he be within us? And yet that's the mystery that we have access to the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit of Jesus, which is God. And you get into the Trinity and people get all going crazy. It's like, well, you're really confusing me. It's one and the same. Uh, and we say that and people still scratch their heads and say, I don't get this one and the same stuff. But you have God the Spirit, Jesus in flesh, and then Jesus speaking through the Holy Spirit, uh, which is the Spirit of God. So it's all the same. Those are the first two mysteries that were really quite a hurdle for some to overcome and still are, by the way, as people today struggle with these. The third thing is about the church. And this was a biggie for Paul. He mentions it, uh, we said last week in Ephesians, where he says that Gentiles are now accepted. Uh, that's another thing. The Jews would never go for that. And they had a real problem with it. Uh, he, he was almost stoned one time because the rumor was he brought Gentiles into the temple, which I think is rather odd because there is a court of the Gentiles in the temple, but it's for Gentiles who've converted to Judaism. So a regular Gentile just can't walk in and say, I want to take a few pictures. You know, uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, any Gentile in the temple is subject to arrest and could be killed or stoned to death. And so they were saying that Paul brought Gentiles into the temple because they're not Jews, they're Christians. But in Paul's mind, when you accept Christ, you're accepting to Judaism You because they see God as the God of the Jews. It took him a while to get over that hump too. But the great mystery is that Gentiles are accepted, uh, which I, like I said last week, it's part of the Abrahamic covenant where it says, Abraham, you'll be a blessing to all people, and gen including Gentiles. But you have to think like a Jew for a while, and then we start thinking like Christians because we're Christians. We're not Jewish, so we don't have that background. We don't have the ceremonies. We don't have any of that stuff. So it's sometimes hard for us to think like a Jew. Um, I, I'm not saying I do it, but I've put myself more into Jewish situations. Um, I used to do a little Seda service with the church I worked in, and I do Tenebrae service and things like that, which have become Christian services, but they come from the Jewish service. Uh, don't have necessarily have Passover, but in a way we do at Easter when we're celebrating before Easter. We're, we're looking at the coming of the Christ the second time, so we got Passover and we see Jesus as the Passover lamb. Uh, but that leads us to the number four of the mysteries. And that's sort of where I'm starting, even though I've already started. But it's spoken of Romans 11. Uh, this is the fourth mystery, if you're taking notes. And I wish they were in chronological order, uh, which tells us that these letters may not be in chronological order because the mysteries are spread all over the place. But chapter 11 of Romans. Okay. Uh, verse 25, and it says, unless you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. So he tells us it's a mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel, Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. 
that last statement sort of needs to be unpacked a little bit. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Now, they do not accept the gospel of Jesus, so that makes them enemies. But how could that be for our sake if they're our enemies? Well, before you give me an answer, I'm going to explain it. Uh, the Jews become enemies because in doing so, it forces a cohesion within the church. I know this sounds a little odd, but if you want something to grow stronger in their bond, apply pressure from the outside. If you want something to spread, disperse it under pressure. And that's exactly what we see in the first century. The Jews applied pressure onto the church, and instead of destroying it, it made them stronger in their bond with one another. And so the church got stronger. They hated the gospel, and in their hatred, they actually made it stronger. Uh, it's sort of like someone who, uh, this is a bad analogy, but as a kid, if you were challenged to a fight, you had you either fought or you run. If you're a little kid in bad shape, you ran. But what happened, it motivated you to go and lift weights and work out and get stronger because if you were confronted again, you wanted to be ready. Same thing happens here. The church uh, literally has to get stronger. Now, the Romans get in on this too because the Romans in 132 will totally disperse all the Jews. And with all the Jews, they disperse all the Christians too. And dispersal meant they sent them to every part of the empire. Uh, and the analogy was given me one time, and it makes sense. If you've ever had to stamp out a fire, you ever done that? Some of you. Story time. I was driving down the road over here from, from uh, 903, and I drove by this pasture, and there was a little black man's house sitting there, and he was sitting on the porch. He had a broken arm. And as I was driving by, I saw in the back of his pasture smoke, and I slowed down, and I looked, and I thought, He's got a grass fire back there in his pasture. And so when I drove by, I saw him sitting there, and he seemed to be totally unaware. So I pulled in. I said, do you know you have a grass fire over there? And he jumped up. He said, no, I didn't. And he starts heading for the pasture. And I thought, well, there's no water. We don't have a blanket. So I said, I'll help you. And so we ran back there. And we didn't have anything. And like a brilliant person I am, Smokey the bear begins to stomp on the fire with his feet. And I thought, oh, this is working. I was stamping out the fire, but when I did, I spread the embers to the next place. Mm -hmm. So I'm like doing the dance of the sugar plum fairies all over this pasture. And that guy, he's looking at me like, you crazy man? And he went and got a blanket and started you know, beating it down. I said, you got another one of those? He said, I don't. I said, well, give me that because you only got one good arm. And uh, with the two of us, we, we beat that fire out. And I said, you know, have you got a hose? He said, no. I said, well, you might want to watch this in case the wind flares it back up. He said, I appreciate it, and I left. But it's so weird. When I left, I was thinking of that analogy about how the fire spread. And I thought, that's how the church was spread. When the Romans stamped it, they just pushed an ember over here, and it popped up and started a new church. Paul was the ember. Paul was persecuted and put under pressure and chased, literally, all over the Mediterranean. Everywhere he went, he started a church. And he usually got beat up for it. But, you know, the, uh, where was Philippi, where they left him for dead? And he got up and went back into town and preached again? Those people thought, man, this guy's hard as a rock. But that's how the church spread, through the pressure. So here, we see the mystery of, of Israel hating the church. And the mystery is that in their hatred the church will spread. And eventually, as it says, that they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. That's talking about Abraham. So God says, well, I'll go back to where he said, uh, a partial hardening has come until the time of the fullness of the Gentiles. What he's saying there is, this hardness of their heart will be directed toward the Gentiles. Uh, you remember how Peter felt about sitting and eating with the Greeks that time? Uh, this is how it was. They did not like Gentiles coming into any of their stuff. Paul got real mad. He said, you are such a hypocrite. Last week at their house, you didn't have a problem sitting at the table. Now we're back over here with the fellow Jews. You want him to sit with them. And Paul, give him down the road, so to speak. And uh, Peter 
had to deal with it. And that's where Peter goes and has the prayer where he sees the sheep lowered with all the stuff. And it's God's way of saying, anything that I clean is clean. And so Peter had to wrap that around his head and think the Gentiles have been cleansed by God. They're clean. And can you imagine uh, a culture that you find to be just abhorrent and so weird and find yourself suddenly saying, they're my brothers and I'm good with it? Um, I don't know how many cultures you've been with, uh, but I know in Africa, when I got there, there was a guy in the group who kept referring to the people as heathers. And uh, I was looking in villages where people, well, the women were half naked, the children were totally naked, the men were off working in the field with a hoe. Uh, it was pagan society. And um, he would talk, and the, the missionary jumped him one day and said, if there's any sin out there, it's in your eyes, not in them. And he shut up after that. But it was an adjustment getting used to going to these people's villages and realizing that here I come from the world of airplanes and stuff like that, and these people, you know, uh, well, another story. It hit hard one night. I picked up some people. We were going to one village, and we were going to go over to another village to preach, and they said, stop at a Fini Yigba and pick up the choir. I said, what? They said, get the choir. Well, if any Igba, there was about 10 people in the choir. I'm in a Volkswagen bus. I've got three missionaries and 10 people in the choir. So we're like this, <laughs> driving, and they're singing. They love to sing the song, Michael, Row Your Boat Ashore. And so we're singing that, and the van is rocking, and I'm driving on a, a path. It's not a road, but the only way you know it's there is you can barely see two routes, and the grass is about this high. And so they said, can you see Brooks? I said, I think I'm on the road. And they said, yeah, you're on the path. Well, and suddenly a deer jumped out. Well, deer jumps out in America, you slam on the brakes. Everybody's screaming. And I, I said, don't worry, I didn't hit the deer. And everybody's mad at me. <laughs> I said, what? They said, Pastor Brooks, why didn't you hit the deer? I said, well, I didn't want to tear up the van. And they said, no, 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 it, that would have fed the village for a week. And I thought, total different perspective on deer in the headlight. I try to avoid the deers. I'm scared to death at night when I drive them, I hit one. Over there, they're hoping you'll kill everything you can find. We, I drove through a field and doves would pop up and they would want to say, let's check the grill. You know, because everything was food. That's a difference in culture that I wasn't ready for and I had to adapt to. Um, their food was another thing I had to adapt to because I thought it was nasty. Uh, but you know me, you should know me. I want to try everything. And so I was in market one day and this lady was rolling up peanut butter balls and dropping them into hot oil and frying the peanut butter balls. And I said, I got to try that. And Mr. Sir said, no, you don't want to try that. I said, but it's just peanut butter. She crushed the peanuts, wrapped them in some oil, rolled them in a ball, dropped them in the hot oil. I said, he said, look at what she's doing. I said, ah, I see. She's making some frying peanut balls. He said, which hand is she using? I said, left hand. He said, oh, my God. I said, oh, yeah, left hand. I forgot about that. For those of you who have not told no you this story. No, there. that's right. They don't have toilet tissue. They have the left hand. <laughs> and that's what we're told. They said, don't ever touch the left hand or take anything from their left hand because it's what they use for toilet tissue. So I thought about hmm, peanut butter, hot oil. Maybe the hot oil killed the feces. <laughs> but I passed on the peanut butter balls. Instead, I went to the small fish. They had little fish about this big, and they'd just take them alive and drop them in the grease, and they'd curl up and turn into like a French fry. I started to eat that, and he said, no, you don't want to eat that. I said, what's wrong with fish? He said, it came out of the mono. I said, oh, the mono? is the river they drink out of, they bathe out of, and they use for a septic tank. So again, I missed out on a lot of good food. I did eat some goat grease in uh, uh, the Yabo plant, or not Yabo, it's a yin yam, but they take the root, they beat it into a paste like uh, potatoes, and they pour fresh goat grease on it. And so one morning we picked up a guy, we're going to drill a well, and he had a bowl. And I said, what is that? He said, it's Yabo, uh, not Yabo, Yingyan. I said, that he said, you want some? I said, yeah. 
and there's no spoon. He's sitting up there, two fingers, shoveling it in. I said, I, how you do it? He said, two fingers. And I, I grabbed me a scoop, shovel my mouth, the missionary goes, ah! I said, what? He said, what do you know what you're doing? I said, what? He said, he's eating out of that with his fingers. You don't know what germs he's putting in that you just put in your mouth. I said, yeah, I didn't think that. But it was good goat grease because they'd killed a goat last week and they kept them fat and they'd melt it for the grease and pour it over the end. But any, I think it's because I'm so weird, but anybody else would be throwing up by now. Uh, I loved it. And the missionary said, you're going to be sick. And I didn't get sick. I said, I, I got a pretty strong constitution. I said, and I want to see what these people's life is like. And I did. And that was me accepting a totally different culture. And the missionaries, I was surprised at the missionaries and the other guys in the team that I was with. They just thought that was terrible. I said, guys, I said, you're tall, calling these people terrible. And these are the people we come to live with and they're being so nice to us. I said, I think it's rude not to eat their yin yam and goat grease. Uh, and they just didn't. So I patted myself on the back and I thought, I think I'm being better at accepting this. You know, I'll brag about this every time. I was the first white person to dance in the village. One night we were there. I played my guitar. We talked, and they started. They had all kinds of. They started playing, singing, and dancing, and they were raising the dust up. And one of them came over and said, "Yabo, yabo." They called me Yabo the whole time I was there. By the way, I found out that meant big white hairy dog. And <laughs> they said Yabo, yabo. And so I got up and I and the. One missionary said, they want you to dance. I said, is it okay? He said, we don't do it. I said, I do. And, <laughs> and what I danced with them. I showed them a few moves. They picked up some moves. I picked up some of theirs. But it's what Peter struggled with. It's what Paul did not struggle with. And I think that's interesting too. Uh, he saw these people as brothers in Christ almost immediately and was hungry to go and bring them into the fold. It took the other disciples, and some of them, we don't know if they ever did overcome that because you don't hear about a lot of the other disciples. They went to different places, but we don't hear about a lot of Gentile conversions. We hear a lot of Jewish conversions. But anyway, this mystery is about how the Jews are going to help to spread Christianity by hating on Christianity. But then when the Gentiles become full, they're going to start converting. Now, that seems impossible until you realize it's happening now. Uh, I told you the first time I went to a Seda service was a professor at Lenore Ryan College. I had a Christian club at, at Caldwell Community College, so he invited me down to his college club for Seda. And we were sitting there, and he said, don't worry. He said, I'm a Christian. I said, I thought you were Jew. He said, I'm Jewish too. He said, I'm a completed Jew. He said, I was born Jew. I've converted to Christianity, and it is the fulfillment of my Judaism. I thought, I've never heard that, but he called himself a completed Jew. And we did the Seda, everything in the Seda, the way the Jews had done it since the time of Moses. And at the end of the Seda, he said, and on the same night, the Lord took bread, and we had a little communion at the very end. And I thought, this is how it was. Jesus was at a Passover service, a Seda service. He went through the whole service, and just like the Bible says, and at the end, he took the cup and the bread and instituted the completion of that service. It's incredible. And this is the mystery that happens. Now, the next mystery, I've got them listed in order, but they're not in order, is um, it's called the translation. It's in 1 Corinthians, and this is Paul talking again. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. This is mystery number five. And Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must be on, put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, 
Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Now, a couple of interesting things about this. We hear people preach this sting of death stuff as if that's what happens when you're saved. But Paul's clearly saying that death will not be totally defeated until Christ returns the second time. Because that's what it's talking about, when Christ returns. The other interesting thing about this that some people, I think, miss is he gives us the order of events. You know, everybody talks about the rapture. Oh, I want to be in the rapture. I want to be taken up. He doesn't even mention the rapture. He says that when Christ returns, we're not all going to sleep. But he doesn't say the part about when Christ returns, but he alludes to that. He says not everybody's going to sleep. And that means die. And he says that we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And that transformation is something that isn't fully explained, but it's part of the mystery. Uh, and he says it's sort of Sort of common sense. A human being cannot go to heaven because heaven is not about flesh and blood. Now, I know that disturbs a lot of people because every time you hear people talk about heaven, they talk about walking streets of gold and stuff like that. Jesus even used the metaphor of mansions. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. Um, but that was a metaphor. But, you know, look at our hymns. Remember that hymn? We never sing it, but cattle on a thousand hills. You ever remember that old hymn? We talk in physical terms. I preached a sermon several years back in which I talked about how someone was an outdoorsman. They're probably out hunting and fishing. But in my mind, I knew better not. But it's sort of what pleases people and soothes them a little bit to think of the loved one still continuing what they normally do. We One of the great mysteries we don't have is what really is it like in heaven? It is a spiritual place. And we as mortal beings don't know what that's like. Uh, to be a spirit is to be without a body. But we will have a glorified body. But we don't know what that's like either. Uh, some have made the thought, and it may be true, that when the Bible talks about glory, it talks about different kinds of glory. And they always talk about Shekinah glory. And the Shekinah glory is the radiance of God. So you think in terms of light. So it might be saying that we will be a, a being of light, which would make sense because it says Jesus is the light that has come. Now, all of this could be metaphorical, but you have to wonder, could some of it be real? Uh, when people have said they have seen angels and stuff like that, usually they see this being of light, and then they make it physical. Um, Angels are two kinds of beings, too, by the way. There can be the heavenly angel, which is a spiritual being. But God also uses people as angels. Now you think, wait a minute, what the thought that people can be angels? Not dead people, living people, because the word angel or angelos in the Greek is a messenger. So if someone comes to you with a message that's from God, they don't have to be an angel. They could be a person that God has sent to you. And if you ever stop and think about people who have come to you in times of need and spoken to you, and you think, that was what I needed to hear. And a lot of times, that's God using that person as his angel. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be an actual angel. Now, I've talked about Mormons. Mormonism was, was built on an angel. Uh, the angel Moroni visited Joseph Smith in his room, scared him to death. And the description of that, and I mentioned this to Mormons, I said, you, do you listen to the description? Because in the description, Joseph Smith said, first, there was a dark cloud that engulfed him, and he felt the deepest terror he had ever felt. And then at the foot of his bed, as the cloud began to move away, he saw an angel of light, and he said, I am Moroni. And I thought, if I was the devil, I think that's how I would show up. You know, an angel ought to show up, you know, in the light and, you know, make you feel comfortable. Uh, their angel that scared them to death, and it still does. People in the temple talk about having an angel intervention and an angel epiphany, and it's always frightening. So I thought, I'd think about that, guys. But anyway, uh, what's going to happen to us is we will be changed into that spiritual being. Now, those who are dead will be changed as well, and their spirit will be resurrected. Now, this is confusing with what John says, because John talks about seeing people coming out of the grave. 
uh, and he makes it seem like a physical body will come out of the grave, and that's led to a lot of confusion because you got some people that believe, I think Seventh-day Adventists believe that you're buried, you're stay in the grave until you're called out. Uh, Mormons believe that, but it's only for women. Girls, it's sort of funny because you can't get out of your grave until your husband calls you out. Now, if you've been married a couple of times, somebody's not getting out. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we've seen a lot of confusion because people interpret these verses without having full knowledge. And I'm not claiming to have full knowledge either because they're not fully explained. It's, as, it's almost as if either Paul knew that some of these people already knew or Paul wasn't interested in explaining the details. He was just giving them a general idea that there's going to be a transformation. That transformation, or as they call the translation from physical to spiritual, must happen. It's going to happen to the dead first, then it's going to happen to us. So we're going to be alive and then translated into a spiritual being. Now, think for a second, and this is where I mess with people's heads. What does it mean to be translated? What does what happens to the body? You ever thought about it? Is it just the like the body returns to dust? And what is that called in scary terms? You die. The physical person that you are will die. And I've tried to tell people if you look at what the rapture says, they talk about the rapture and they say, Oh, it's going to be great. You know, the airplane pilot's going to take off and I'm just going to go out of my clothes and I'll be naked going up into the sky. Uh, I don't know where they got the idea that they'll be naked, I guess because it says, but they'll be translated. So I, got, I told somebody one time, I said, what if the rapture is not this glorious moment where suddenly people just go whoosh and everybody looks around and says, where are they? What if it is death that we will be murdered? Because in the end, the people that come back with Jesus, it's not everybody. It's the martyrs, the people who were killed. And there are more martyrs today than they were in the past. And that subsequently means that there's going to be more martyrs. The closer we get to the end time, there's going to be more people martyred because he comes back with a host and they wear blood-dipped robes to show that they were murdered for the sake of Christ. Now that puts a whole different tilt on the rapture and people don't like it. It's like, no, no, no. I don't want to be murdered. I want to just jump out of my clothes and float up in the sky naked. Uh, but that's not exactly what it says. It goes back to this mystery of translation. For some, death is frightening. To the Christian, it should be mysteriously exciting because we're going to be changed from mortal to immortal. That's what he says. From perishable to imperishable. And Paul is giving us this as mystery number five. Uh, and like I said, he doesn't fully explain it other than to say that death, is swallowed up in victory. No more death. The sting of death, the pain that we think of death, no more. I, I think about this, might not be one, but I've always heard this from women because, and the Bible sort of looks to it too. Women have children and they say it's the most horrible pain they ever experienced, but then they want to do it again. I've had a kidney stone, I don't want to do it again. You don't remember that pain. There you go. The sting of pain is gone somehow. And yet, the screaming that you remember is like, oh, you know, how do you forget that? But, you know, women do this. Women, you're a little interesting in that way. But that's what the Bible says. The sting of death, it's sort of like, I think it's like childbirth. You bring that child into the world, you're so loved, full of love and excited about that that you forget about all the suffering that you had to go through to bring that child into the world. We will forget about the suffering we have gone through in being translated or dying for Christ. We'll be so focused on being a spiritual being, an eternal being, an immortal being. Uh, and I don't even know what that means, to be honest with you, because I can't even imagine infinite immortality. Uh, we, we think linear. We can't help it. We're linear creatures. We're born, we live, we die, we're on a line. But you have to think that in infinity, there is no line. We're not going anywhere. We're not, it's like, I'm going to infinity and beyond. Well, we're not Buzz Lightyear from the Disney movie. We're just there forever, never dying. 
And time is passing, but it's not passing for us. It's passing in the universe. And if there will be, I'm sure there will be a universe. Anyway, uh, moving from there, i got to find mystery number six. Because it's hidden from it. Here it is. The sixth mystery is in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, and this one, too, I find sort of interesting. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now, that's interesting. This is a mystery that's already started. These other mysteries have sort of started. Some will be delayed for later. But the mystery of lawlessness has already started. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all, with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends a strong delusion so that they believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but took pleasure in unrighteousness. The mystery of lawlessness is that God is going to allow Satan certain power in the end. And that power will be used with a delusion. But he is going to do deception and he's going to have the power of false signs and wonders. Now the key to that is false signs and wonders. If it's signs and wonders, that's like, whoa, we're going to see a miracle. Anybody ever watch... Uh, yes. I'm huh? sorry, but Mine has signs and false wonders. Okay, signs of false wonders. Anybody ever gone to a magician show and just been wowed? How did he do that? You ever heard of, I think his name is David Blaine. I was watching one of his shows one time. He's really weird. But he went through a window and showed up on the other side. They had a little sheet, and you think, well, you trick window. But they showed the windows, made out of glass, and it didn't break, and you can see the edges where it doesn't move, and all of a sudden he's on one side of the window, and then it's like the blanket falls over the window, and they move the blanket. He's standing on the other side of the window. I was like, how did he do that? That's one of the best ones I ever saw. And, you know, they used to have a show where this magician reveals how they do their tricks. Nobody ever told about how they did that one. You know, they make airplanes disappear. Oh, an elephant disappeared. Um, What's that good-looking magician all the girls fell in love with a long time ago? Copperfield. 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 Yeah. Do you do you remember on TV he made an elephant disappear? Do you remember that he never brought it back? He was in an interview, I read it recently, where he said, I purposely didn't bring that elephant back because I want people to wonder what happened to the elephant. He said, you know, people come to me and still say, what happened to the elephant? And he didn't tell us, but the truth is, the elephant never went anywhere. They just changed the camera angle. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a, this one night with my youth and, and I did a magic trick and I took a deck of cards and I had a video and so I had everybody choose some cards and I took the deck of cards and there was a person on the video screen and, and they were giving instructions they said now throw the deck of cards at the screen and I threw the deck of cards at the screen and suddenly on the screen three cards showed up in the television. And I said, three people here have that. And they freaked out. I've got those cards. I've got that. I've got that card. And everybody's like, oh, and everybody else is like going crazy. How did you do that, Brooks? I said, can't tell you. It's magic. <laughs> but it's called setup magic. I'd already told the three people what cards they were going to have and, and to act like they're really surprised. And that's what they do a lot of times with setup magic. You act surprised when you knew what was going to happen. And the video was already set for which cards are going to show up. But those are false wonders and false signs, too, because Satan is going to do tricks. Now, if, if a man can do a magic trick that can just befuddle the world, what do you think Satan can do? He's been doing it for a long time. And this is what we're going to see. And people are going to believe it. Now, they're going to believe it for two reasons. One He's a good magician. 
But the other thing is the ace in the hole for Satan is God has allowed a delusion to come on people. And you say, mean old God. Well, it's not mean old God. He has allowed it. Now, what God does in his allowance is he allows you to choose. And you choose to believe the delusion. And if you choose it, that's your fault. Because the Holy Spirit will convict you of the truth. But people sin and then say, oh, I didn't know I was sinning. Yes, you did. When I sin, I know I'm sinning. Do I stop sinning? Sure. Folks, we all fall to temptation. We all sin. The difference between us and non-Christians is God lets us know we sin, and that brings us to repentance. Because I've never done something I knew was wrong that I didn't ask God to forgive me for. That's an, the impartable sin if I don't do it. But there are people who are going to be deluded, and there's still people deluded right now saying, I didn't do that. Have you been watching the news? Now, I shouldn't say this, but Alec Baldwin on that interview said, I, I didn't pull that trigger. It's like, well, you were holding the gun. Well, I might have been holding that gun, but I didn't pull that trigger. Somebody else is responsible. I'm not responsible. I thought, how deluded is that? But he's trying to come up with a defense where he says, the gun just went off. You know, and there wasn't even supposed to be a bullet there. They were doing target practice the day before. It's stuff like that that we're seeing every day. I'm seeing it more and more because I look for it, and I thought, this world is under a delusion. People are telling you something that you can see with your own eyes is a lie, and yet we're supposed to believe, oh, the, the guy who ran through the parade, did you hear the news coverage? The car did. The car did it. There wasn't a guy. It, the car ran through the parade. The guy was just stuck in there, you know, saying, please stop, car. I thought, come on, people. Stop trying to tilt things every which way. Uh, but we live in a world where we're trying our best to make sin okay, and it doesn't work. Uh, I've got one more delusion, but I've run out of time. I don't, I don't want you to be, well, you're already going to be late for church, I'm thinking. But I'm going to give you delusion number seven next week. But I want you to think about these things because uh, you've heard me say this before. I even did a lesson on that passage of Scripture because I think this is where we are, what we're in, mystery six right now. Because I see the world getting more delusional, and I see people hating the truth more. And when you hate the truth, you're loving the lie. And people will fight you to defend their lie. And they will fight you because you tell the truth. The day and age where truth tellers were considered honorable men is gone. Today we, we think people that can swindle and you know con us, we consider them heroes. That's all I'll say about that. But anyway, next week we'll do that. Let's do a prayer. Uh, I see some more folks are here watching us. And so we're going to pray for everybody that was on our prayer list. Some of you folks at home didn't might not have heard it, but uh, our prayer list is rather lengthy, so just pray with us. Let's pray now, and I'll let you go to church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together and the opportunity to share in this lesson, to, to learn and understand the mysteries of our own religion, which today are not as mysterious for everyone, but some people don't understand it. So Lord, help us to explain it to them, to learn to teach. We mentioned so many prayer requests today, and Lord, you've heard it. You know the needs, you know the desires that people have in their lives and in the family's lives. For those that are sick, those who are displaced, those that are going through troubles, those that are worried, they're concerned about everything from jobs to family members. But Lord, we just pray that you would give them peace and strength. Maybe not in that order, but maybe they need strength and then peace. But Lord, we trust you. We trust your will and your keeping of our, our brothers and sisters. And help us to minister to them. Let us be the angel that you might need to send. Lord, forgive us when we're not very angelic, though. And forgive us in our weaknesses. Forgive us in the times that we sort of lay you aside and we get focused on everything around us and we forget that you are the God that we serve and you are the God that serves us with peace and hope and love. So, Lord, forgive us of our weaknesses. Strengthen us. Make us to be your people, the people you want us to be. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. Now you have to run down those steps and I'll take the elevator. <laughs>